the royal family, the epitome of high standards, decency and dignity. From the Queen to minor royals, the House of Windsor live under the constant glare of public scrutiny. Harry was dressed in this Nazi uniform. When that photograph was revealed and was published by the newspapers, all hell broke out. When they fall from grace, it's front page news. The Prince of Wales was in fact in love with another woman. That exposed the whole fragile state of the marriage. Whether it's what they're saying. For Prince Philip to refer to them as having slitty eyes, I mean, that's completely unacceptable. How they're behaving. He had not enough to do. He was falling out of nightclubs, somewhat inebriated. Or who they fall in love with. He was divorced. She was a princess. The royal household were absolutely aghast. The media had an absolute field day when this relationship became public. It was very racy royal girlfriend indeed. Royal scandals matter. The repercussions ripple through Britain. For the first time, you have a senior member of the royal family actually telling the world what is wrong with her marriage. Controversy can even cast questions over the crown itself. You think, well, why are we having a royal family if this is how they behave? Some royal scandals are beyond the palace's control, whether it's unwanted intruders. It was a huge scandal at the time. Horrifying for a nation who expect their monarch to be better protected or troublesome in-laws there will always be debacles with the markles and whenever they step into the light they will cause another scandal these are the stories that caused scandals at the palace told by those that witnessed them but well, the whole thing was embarrassing for the royal family not only did she wash her dirty linen in public before it was washed she held it up so everybody could see every little stain House of Windsor, an institution at the heart of our nation. The royal family really goes to the very essence of as who we as Brits identify as and see who we are. The Queen is amazing because she's our head of state. Unlike previous royals, the Windsors rule during a media age like no other. The idea of that goldfish bowl, which the royal family live in, means that scandals are never very far away because the world is watching. However hard the royal family may try to control its image, it's almost impossible to do so when scandals erupt. And no scandal caused as much damage to the House of Windsor as the day Princess Diana decided to reveal all about the state of her royal marriage. Diana had and nurturing the relationship. She did it with several journalists. She did it with writers. She did it with me. After their fairy tale wedding in 1981, Diana became the most scrutinized woman in the world. Diana was the biggest star, the biggest celebrity on the planet. If you wrote a story about Princess Diana, it was on the front page no matter what. But not all the headlines were positive. Some press reports suggested that all was not well between her and Charles. Diana wanted to make sure the public heard her side of the story, even if it caused a huge scandal. In 1992, she dropped a bombshell that would rock the House of Windsor to its core. She secretly cooperated on a tell-all biography with journalist Andrew Morton. Princess Diana felt that she didn't have a voice. She was trapped inside the palace and people didn't know her plight. She was approached by Andrew Morton through an intermediary called James Coldhurst. He acted as a go-between. Andrew Morton gave him the questions. James put the questions to Diana, and she answered them in a tape recorder, and the tape was given to Andrew Morton. Coldhurst made repeated clandestine visits to Kensington Palace and taped several conversations with Diana. I was working with Diana in 1992 and was completely unaware of her liaison with the go-between James Coulthurst. Had I been aware of it, or had I been advised of it, at that particular time, I would have probably in encouraged her not to do it. Diana's butler, Paul Burrell, was one of her closest confidants. Even he was kept in the dark until shortly before the book's publication. I remember saying to her, do you think it's a good idea? And she said, well, it's done now, it's too late. She didn't seem to care. This was her chance 
to tell the world exactly what she felt. During the conversations, Diana had revealed some of her most intimate secrets. Andrew Morton knew when published, they would cause a sensation. He just could not believe what he was seeing. I mean, he knew he'd struck gold, but he was brave. And you know, he was determined to go ahead and publish. In the weeks before the book's release, rumors of its existence circulated amongst the press. During an official visit to Budapest, Diana was confronted by the Queen's press secretary, Dickie Arbiter. She categorically denied that she had given any assistance whatsoever to Andrew Morton. She had that sort of look on her face, and I knew that she was being economical with the truth. But you don't tell... The story was published in January 1992. It shocked the world, though many greeted its claims with disbelief. The motivation was to tell the truth. For once, forget the propaganda, tell the truth about what's really going on, because we do face a crisis in the House of Windsor. It's obvious to everyone. And make, and you, and make you a rich man. Well, if, if that's a corollary, then so be it. The book alleged Diana had been driven to bulimia, severe depression and self-harm. It was headline news in every newspaper, every TV channel. The fact that Diana released such personal details about her life it was just one thing after another, what she thought of the royal family, how they treated her. It was one of the biggest scandals ever. We knew that they weren't happy, but we thought they were managing that unhappiness. Morton's book showed that they, in fact, led very separate lives, and that as far as Princess Diana was concerned, her husband, the Prince of Wales, was, in fact, in love with another woman, Camilla Parker Bowles. Royal author Lady Colin Campbell knew Princess Diana well, and has also written a biography of her. The whole thing was embarrassing for the royal family. Not only did she wash her dirty linen in public, before it was washed, she held it up so everybody could see every little stain. The most shocking claim in Andrew Morton's book was that Diana threw herself down the stairs while four months pregnant because she was so unhappy. While many poured scorn on the claim, Paul Burrell says he remembers the incident well. I was actually at Sandringham when I heard this enormous clatter on the wooden staircase to find the princess halfway down it, faking a tumble while she was carrying Prince William. There's no way on this planet that she would put at harm her unborn baby, but she wanted attention. I think the Andrew Morton book was a cry for help. Diana and Charles's marriage was under the spotlight like never before. So too his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. After Diana and Charles's separation, he decided it was his turn to bear all to the media. In an ITV documentary, he admitted he'd been unfaithful during the marriage, but only after it had irretrievably broken down. Now that Charles's affair with Camilla was public knowledge, Diana was determined to use the media to hit back again, with the biggest royal interview of all time. The princess always thought that revenge was a dish best served cold. Undeterred by the scandal that would inevitably ensue, once again Diana secretly collaborated with a journalist to broadcast her side of the story. During the summer of 1995, she'd been introduced to a young man working for Panorama called Martin Bashir, and heads of the palace. Diana and Martin Bashir would go on to hold a series of secret meetings. I used to go to White City and bring him back in my car in the boot so that nobody would see him. Martin Bashir would relish the prospect of being brought into Kensington Palace in the boot mysteriously, secretly. Diana eventually agreed to Martin Bashir's request to film an interview. But fearful Buckingham Palace would find out, she kept it a secret, even from her press secretary, Geoffrey Crawford. At the time, for her press secretary and for the Queen not to know that this explosive interview was being planned and then filmed and then broadcast without knowledge was an extraordinary breach of protocol. Paul Burrell had helped arrange Diana's meetings with Bashir, but she was obsessed with secrecy. It was a Sunday afternoon. The princess said, you haven't seen your family this week. Why don't you go home and see your wife and children? I thought, this is strange. I took the opportunity to go home. The coast was now clear. The panorama team 
were secretly admitted to Kensington Palace. Their cameras were set up over a weekend. There was no one around. And they actually got the whole thing in the can before Diana admitted what was going on. Monday morning, I arrived back at the palace to notice all the furniture had been moved in the Prince of Wales study. And I said to the princess, why have these chairs been moved in different directions? Oh, oh, um, I had a dance class yesterday afternoon. Later that evening, she confided in me that Martin Bashir and the camera crew had been into the palace to film the interview. Oh, my goodness, I said, you didn't say anything you shouldn't say, did you? She said, well, I did say a few things. Would you say that you were happily married? Very much so. But uh, the pressure on, on, on us both as a couple with the media was phenomenal. I think the thing people remember most is her description of her marriage and the fact that there was a third party in their marriage, namely um, Camilla Parker Bowles, whom she made clear had been having an affair with the Prince of Wales, her husband. The princess came across as doe-eyed, vulnerable, hurt, wounded. She knew exactly what she was doing, even down to her makeup and the way she was dressed. The way she presented herself on that panorama interview was key to winning over the hearts of the nation. It got more than 22 million viewers. You can also see why the royal household was so totally devastated by it, and they didn't even know it was happening when it was being planned. With army officer James Hewitt. Yes, I adored him. Yes, I was in love with him. She just needed somebody to love her. Diana would make one more shocking comment about Charles's future role as king. Being Prince of Wales produces more freedom now, and being king would be a little bit more suffocating. And because I know the character, I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. Some think Diana was driven by an ulterior motive. The thing that people objected to, not only in the royal family, but in establishment circles, was how she had tried to deprive Charles of his rights to the throne. Her agenda was, if the Queen dies and Charles is out of the line of succession, William becomes king and she can work herself into the position of being regent. I mean, the whole thing was madness. Diana's interview made headlines the world over. The House of Windsor was under scrutiny like never before. So for the first time, it's in modern royal history, you have a senior member of the royal family actually telling the world what is wrong with her marriage, what is wrong with her husband, why I'm so unhappy in this, why it's about time that I left the royal family. That was the story. It was a story that nobody really expected would happen, but it did. A scandal could bring down the monarchy. Diana almost did. She wouldn't have been proud of that. But I think the royal family are only there for as long as people want them to be there. Diana's revelations were a watershed for the House of Windsor. However, she wasn't the only royal to court publicity and cause scandal. The Queen Mother in particular was incensed that in one fell swoop, Edward had managed to set them up to be complete laughing stocks. As reigning monarch for over 65 years, the Queen has had to endure decades of royal scandals. Many have involved her four children. The youngest, Prince Edward, and his wife Sophie, nowadays keep a low profile. He's the only one with a successful marriage of the Queen's three boys. He's the only one um, whose marriage hasn't ended in divorce, still happily married with two children. In his younger days, Edward attracted his fair share of headlines. Like Diana, he courted the media, in his case with sometimes disastrous results. Edward's first taste of controversy came in 1986. After graduating from Cambridge University, he followed his father theatre, but Edward decided to go into the Marines, which was a surprise for some people because he didn't appear to be cut out for it. This was a classic example where someone could, should have taken Edward on one side and said, this might not be your cup of tea. Just four months into his training at Sandhurst, Edward dropped a bombshell. Ingrid Seward was writing a biography of him at the time. 
Prince Edward was home for the weekend and he told his family that he was going to quit the Marines. And they said, don't be ridiculous. And they talked him round. He said, oh, OK, I'll stay. And he drove back to his base camp the next morning and handed in his recognition. And Princess Anne was driving back to Gloucestershire and nearly put a car in the ditch when she heard on the radio that Edward had resigned because the last thing she knew, that they'd had this really good talk, and he'd said he'd stay in. The news was received uh, with a natural disappointment that His Royal Highness had come to this decision. Some members of the royal family felt he'd let the side down. Uh, the Queen Mother was one who, who felt disappointed in her grandson's behaviour. His father, Prince Philip, was apparently very upset and angry because, of course, you know, what's a royal to do if they're not to be in the armed forces? Soldiers make an oath to Queen and country for a member of the royal family not to be up to it in terms of joining a military unit was damaging. After quitting the Marines, Edward was free to indulge his real passion. Hurrah, hurrah. <laughs> During university, he'd developed a love for the performing arts. Edward had always been seen as a man who seemed to be at his happiest on the stage. He also managed to convince other members of the House of Windsor to take part in a TV special, It's a Royal Knockout. All this quasi-excitement doesn't really matter a damn to you, then? No, we're the strong, silent types. <laughs> we're the best blue bandits there are. <laughs> the programme was widely seen as a really low point for the House of Windsor. It was an incredibly kind of toe-curlingly embarrassing affair. You've got the members of the royal family prancing in period costume. They look like extras from the Tudor court. I think it was quite dangerous for the royal family in a way, because you think, well, why are we having a royal family if this is how they behave? If you see these people running around, mucking about, like six-year-olds or three-year-olds even, and you think, well, am I giving my taxpayers money for this? It's a nonsense. On the day the programme was filmed, Edward gave a press conference to the waiting media, but it turned into yet another piece. Have you? Well, thanks for sounding so bloody enthusiastic. <laughs> Richard Kay was the Daily Mail's royal correspondent covering the day's events and was at the press conference. And he said, what did you think of it? Well, we couldn't really answer because we hadn't been allowed to see it, at which point Edward sort of threw his toys out of the pram, if you like. What did you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> thanks. I thought it was great. He displayed a very impetuous side of his character, and, of course, it was reflected in the television broadcasts and the newspaper accounts at the time. If Edward hoped It's a Royal Knockout would bring the royal family's image up to date, the whole affair did precisely the opposite. The Queen Mother, in particular, was incensed. That in one fell swoop, Edward had managed to set them up to be complete laughing stocks. And she, having tried so hard to kind of reposition her family and, obviously, her daughter as modern, with dignity and gravitas. They are prancing around in Tudor costume, kind of laughing and braying in front of the cameras. It took them back several years. The fiasco didn't deter Edward from embarking on a career in television. In 1993, he started his own TV company, Ardent Productions. At the time, he made the mistake in saying, well, I'm not going to work on my royal connections, but practically every documentary he made had a royal connection. In 2001, Ardent were commissioned to make a series called A to Z of royalty for an American TV channel. Prince William was about to start university at St Andrews. At the time, it was a big story. There was an agreement in place between the palace and the media that we would turn up to cover Prince William's first day at university and we would then leave, which we all duly did. Except there was one film crew that didn't pack up and leave and, ironically enough, that was Edwards. Edward's film crew broke the agreement Clarence House struck with the media and continued to film around the university. Edward and his media career once again attracted all the wrong headlines. Edward was very defensive about it, uh, maintaining that uh, they weren't stalking Prince William, they were merely doing some extra shots they wanted to take up there. It did look very much like there were, there were two rules, one rule for, for the working press, if you like, the media, and another for the royal family. It looked 
favoritism. Press reports claimed Ardent's bungling caused a huge bust up between Edward and William's father. Prince Charles was apoplectic about it. When news reached him that there was still a camera there, there was quite a colorful uh, phone conversation had between the two brothers. Ardent were forced to issue a public apology. It was a massive case, end of Edward's fledgling production career. Edward's television career was subject to press ridicule from the beginning. It was symbolic of the media's changing relationship with the royals. In the years immediately after the war, the British media showed far more deference to the monarchy. But in the 1950s, that began to change. The threat of scandal forced Princess Margaret to abandon her plans to marry. Her suitor, a member of the royal staff, named Peter Townsend. Peter Townsend was a war hero, a fighter pilot, very glamorous. But Peter Townsend had been married before, and in those days, that created a huge scandal. The obstacles were enormous. He was divorced, she was a princess, the royal household were absolutely aghast. It was seen as a, a scandal because you can't do that as a role. You can't get involved with somebody who is divorced. It's not done. Sir Alan Lassells, who was the private secretary to the Queen, when Townsend went to tell him of the news when that they intended to marry, Lassells said, you must be either mad or bad or both. The Royal Marriages Act meant Margaret needed her sister, the Queen, to agree to the marriage. But her role as head of the church placed Elizabeth in a compromising situation. The Queen was head of the Church of England, therefore could not condone the remarriage of divorced people in church. So for Princess Margaret, that was going to be tricky. Divorce was a dirty word. It was a dirty word in terms of the church. It was a dirty word in terms of government. In those days, the church did not recognize divorce. They knew it was happening, but they didn't recognize it. They didn't like it. As the church and the powers in the government pressed the queen to oppose the marriage, the romance was about to become public knowledge. An eagle-eyed reporter saw Margaret brush a bit of fluff off Group Captain Peter Townsend's RAF tunic, and royals don't brush fluff off the hired help's tunic, and they thought, aha, there's something here. It was out in the open, they couldn't disguise it. That gesture of the bit of fluff went right round the world and was, in fact, a major story which led unquestionably to a crisis. This was a public display of affection which was very unwise. The press latched onto this enticing story. It offered romance, drama and real danger for the House of Windsor. The country was hooked. Margaret was really the first celebrity royal. People were fascinated in her life, and she was dating someone who was a commercial character, and this was quite a racy royal romance, so it made the headlines. Unfortunately, the fact that he had been divorced was a big issue, and whereas um, a lot of people were privately sympathetic to Princess Margaret, there was still this, this huge issue hanging over it. The romance was doomed. Margaret was presented with a choice. If she married Townsend, she would have to give up her title as princess. She chose her duty to the crown. She issued a rare statement in which she said that she had decided not to marry Peter Townsend. She recognized that being Princess Margaret and given her place in line to the British throne, that actually it was a case of duty before self and that was what she decided to do. It was the first of the post-war scandals to hit the royal family. It was tragedy in many ways that, that the Margaret hadn't been able to marry him. He was her first love, the big love of her life. The Queen's intervention quelled the growing controversy around Princess Margaret's love affair. But the damage to royal reputations was done, and the floodgates had been opened. The age of deference was over. The royal family was now fair game. Half a century later, tales of a tearaway prince would create more shocking headlines in the tabloid press. Prince Harry did have a very troubled adolescence. He missed his mother a lot. Prince Harry. He served Queen and country. He campaigns for all kinds of worthwhile causes. And 
He's one half of a real-life royal fairy tale. Sixth in line to the throne, these days he's undoubtedly one of the most popular members of the royal family. But a few years ago, he was no stranger to tabloid scandals. Harry's always been the one who knew he'd never be king. Didn't matter. So Harry could do exactly what Harry wanted. Harry was doing his A-levels at Eton College, but was destined to join the armed forces. The army was always his first love. I remember him as a five and six year old strutting around Kensington Palace in army fatigues with a parachute regiment beret. But before serving in the military, Harry was grabbing the headlines. He had not enough to do. He was falling out of nightclubs, somewhat inebriated. In 2002, the antics of the 17-year-old were to make front-page news. He got involved with smoking cannabis uh, and drinking too much, so his dad took him by the ear and took him to a rehab centre. Prince Charles was so concerned at how often his younger son was using cannabis that he insisted he visited the Featherstone Lodge Centre in South London. Prince Harry met a story, caused a stir, and would become a major front-page splash. The news of the world that got a hold of the story and, you know, put it to the palace and we're going to go around with the big story about drugs. Prince Charles's spin doctor at the time, Mark Bolland, later said they decided to cooperate with the news of the world to try and present the story positively. They showed the Prince of Wales in a good light by saying as a dad he was, was taking his kids to the rehab centre to show the dangers of drugs and drink. And the news of the world would go along with it because then they could run the story on the drugs anyway. What youngster of that age wasn't falling out of nightclubs or pubs? It happens all the time. Even if you've got a protection officer in tow, that you know you are going to get up to things that maybe you shouldn't. Others in the media speculated that Harry was struggling to cope with the death of his mother at the age of 12. Prince Harry did have a very tough time after the death of his mother. He had a very troubled adolescence, very public displays of fighting with photographers and getting drunk. I think he missed his mother a lot and didn't really have a role in life. I think Harry's wild teenage years have a direct link to losing his mother. William and Harry walked behind Diana's coffin as part of the funeral cortege. Having grown up with them, of the two boys, I always worried about Harry most. An almost intolerable moment for the two boys, the two princes. Impossible to put into words. I knew that William was of an age he could understand his mother's passing, and Harry wasn't. And that really did affect his teenage years. He admitted a couple of years ago that he suffered mental health as a result of the death of his mother. At the time, he said no 12-year-old should be asked to walk behind a coffin. But then Prince Harry's no ordinary 12-year-old. He's a prince of the United Kingdom. After the rehab story, the press became increasingly interested in Harry's personal life. This was a difficult time for Harry. When Harry and William were at school, the press had voluntarily signed this agreement with the palace that they would give the boys their privacy. That was a big deal on Fleet Street. They were prepared to do that. But of course, once they left school, all bets were off. With Harry viewed as fair game by the tabloids, the floodgates opened. It was a fancy dress party with a colonial theme. Um, Harry, for some reason beyond most people's understanding, decided that he was going to dress up with Nazi insignia, which a guest caught and photographed and, and sold to the sun. He made this very, very mistake, um, obviously deeply inappropriate, going to this fancy dress party, which itself had a pretty dodgy theme, colonialism. And obviously, when that photograph uh, was a sort of global upset, I was in Barbados at the time, and I was talking to this minister, and he was horrified. The, the Jewish community were very upset about it, and so they should be. I think everybody should be upset about it, that a member of, of the royal family, the senior member of the royal family at that, was wearing uh, a, a swastika armband. The timing was particularly bad, as it happened two weeks before the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. It was seen as trivialising something that was such an important part of world history. It was a huge scandal for the royal family. It was such an insult to so many people. But obviously Harry hadn't thought about it, and obviously William hadn't thought about it either, or else he would have said, hey, you know, that's a really silly idea. To make matters worse, the press brought up old stories 
about the Nazi connections of Edward VIII, the Queen's uncle. I think Prince Harry inadvertently, by effectively a schoolboy prank, um, brought a, a lot of those feelings back to the fore. The royal family immediately apologised. I don't believe for a minute that he is, he's got those sort of anti-Semitic tendencies. It was just thoughtless, and he really messed up. It could have affected his career in the army. He was just about to go to Sandhurst. But the military academy accepted his application. Then he got the call to the army, and that was the making of him. He excelled as a cadet. He excelled when he joined his regiment, Blues and Royals. Harry was posted to Afghanistan. He became the first member of the royal family to serve in a war zone since his uncle, Prince Andrew. He was trying to find a role for himself, and, and in the army, it seemed he'd found one. He'd served with great distinction. Soon before Harry was due to go on his second tour of duty in Afghanistan, he took a trip to the US. I think going to Vegas was really Harry having his last hurrah before going to war. Harry was going to the front line. In August 2012, footage emerged of Harry at a Las Vegas pool party surrounded by women in bikinis. He let off steam in a way which sort of raised eyebrows. I think that's at the very least. He probably felt no 100% guarantee that he was going to come back in one piece. He might come back in a body bag, might as well let his hair down. And then he did just that. But his send-off party left him with more than just a hangover. He was snapped naked after a game of strip billiards in his hotel suite. The scandal went global. This was front page news, Harry naked in Vegas. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have done it, but his protection team have let him down again. This was a naked boy stall, things going wrong. And on this particular occasion, they didn't. The photos rapidly spread across the world. There was a strong effort by the palace to suppress the pictures, to prevent them being published in this country, and for some time, that held firm. It was quite ludicrous, really, because they'd already been seen by anyone who's got a computer or a phone. They could just tap in and look at them. A few days later, those pictures of the party-loving prince made a splash in this country, too. He was portrayed in the media as a foolish young man who had some life lessons to learn. In many ways, it was, it was rather unfair. I mean, he was only doing what a lot of young men of his age do. I think at the end of the day, when the pictures started appearing, it, it endeared Harry to the great British public. They thought, hey, he's one of us. Ultimately, it was a phase Harry was going through like a lot of kids go through, and just part of his growing up. Today, Harry has dedicated himself to helping young people in mental health charities. And of course, he's very happily married. Some think Harry's wild days actually helped cement his place in the hearts of the public. I think the whole world love Harry. They love a sort of bad boy who's become a good boy, and he's got a lot of charisma. Harry is a progressive modern royal. You either want the royals to be modern or you don't. If they're not modern, they're complaining about them not being modern. If they do modern things, then still complaining. You can't have it both ways. Prince Harry cares a great deal about how he's perceived. But the same couldn't be said of his grandfather. I think there's always a slight intake of breath whenever you see the Duke of Edinburgh on public engagements, because you never quite knew what he was going to say or do next. <laughs> he does have an extraordinary ability to put his foot in it. Before retiring from public engagements well into his 90s, Prince Philip did a remarkable job, accompanying the Queen on royal visits throughout the UK and all over the globe. We've now seen the world's most experienced pluck on <laughs> He's also known for his blunt sense of humour. <laughs> Philip would rather be known for his one-liners than for his gaffes, of course. But nevertheless, that's how many of these um, jokes, if that's what they are, have been interpreted by the media over the years. I mean, he does have a, an extraordinary ability to apparently put his foot in it. Historically, whether he's giving a speech to dignitaries, greeting world leaders, or being given a tour of a hospital, Prince Philip has been known to offend his hosts. Thank you. 
like intake of breath whenever we used to see the Duke of Edinburgh on public engagements because you never quite knew what he was going to say or do next. And that's led to a string of scandals and a huge array of headlines. The Duke of Edinburgh definitely has a reputation for being gaff prone. Some of them are funny. Thank you very much indeed for your kind welcome and for the very nice things you've said about me and also for this excellent dinner. I can tell you that I'm prepared to grace almost anything for a meal like that. <laughs> Some of them are very non-PC. Prince Philip today unveiled an award, but also at one point observed that a somewhat dilapidated fuse box looked as though it was put in by an Indian. And some of them are downright offensive. They don't sound entirely native. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think he can help himself. It he just says what he thinks. And I suppose in the 1920s and 1930s, you could get away with that. Prince Philip is a bore into himself. I think it would take a very, very brave person to say, Sir, by the way, can you just tone it down a bit? No one tells Prince Philip what to do, first and foremost. He is his own man. He says what he thinks and what he feels. At the centre of a storm, the Duke visiting Ely Cathedral today, saying nothing more about handguns. On his behalf, though, a lengthy apology from Buckingham Palace after he questioned the wisdom of new restrictions. He is trying to say the right thing, and sometimes it doesn't come out quite right. His, he's always taken the view that his role is an icebreaker. The Queen is actually remarkably shy. In 2013, Philip met Nobel Prize-winning education campaigner Malali Yousafzai. There's one thing about children going to school. They go to school because their parents don't want them in the house. <laughs> Instead of putting people at ease, sometimes he puts them in the spotlight. In 2010, Navy Sea Cadet Elizabeth Rendell made national news when the Duke asked her if she worked in a strip club. He was with people in uniform. He's always much more comfortable with, with naval and, and army types. And he obviously felt secure in their surrounding that he could crack a joke. While people in the UK are used to his old fashioned sense of humor, on the international stage, the Duke has sometimes threatened diplomatic relations with foreign countries. I don't think he means any genuine offense when he makes these one but unfortunately, he has offended nations and peoples um, around the world. In 2009, the Duke committed one of his most high-profile blunders when meeting Barack and Michelle Obama. Uh, the Chinese, the Russians, David Cameron. <laughs> 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 tell the difference between <laughs> I think Prince Philip asking whether you could tell the difference between Chinese, Russia, have a preponderance of saying something rude about the Chinese. In 1986, while on a state visit to China, Philip made arguably his most infamous and catastrophic blunder of all. They were behind the red flag of China for the very first time, a huge visit because of all the trade potential. Uh, and it went terribly well, up and until Philip's comment. He described Beijing as ghastly and then made further offensive comments about the Chinese people. I was there when he said to a group of students, if you stay here any longer, you'll get slipped. The students themselves weren't offended. However, the hosts were, and um, there was an enormous diplomatic mission undertaken to smooth things over. Of course, on the surface, everyone said they weren't offended at all, but we were always told that behind the scenes, things were very full. I don't think the Queen was overly impressed with that one. The Duke's gaffes may cause tension, but the press have always lapped them up. Some who know the royals feel Philip is treated unfairly. The Prince Philip he likes to relate to people on a human level. He tells jokes that are funny. <laughs> but if you hijack the joke and take it out of its context, it can be misinterpreted. The problem is when Prince Philip makes a gaffe, all the press are absolutely delighted because there they have their story. Royal tours, there's always somebody that goes off on what they call gaff watch. They follow Prince Philip to see if he says anything rude or inappropriate or racist. And he nearly always used to come up with some very funny remark. <laughs> he can be a godsend to the media, but sometimes he does offend. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. There's some classics, like when he went to Australia. In 2001, the Duke was accompanying the Queen on a royal tour of Australia to help mark her 
and Jubilee. The Duke asked Aborigines if they still threw spears at one another. It was just one of those moments where people just didn't know what to say or where to look. This comment caused such uproar and such offence uh, that the palace was forced to release a statement um, to make it very clear that the Duke had, had made these comments with a light heart and that no offence was intended. But, of course, by that point, the damage had been done. He had hugely offended his hosts. In spite of, or perhaps because of, Prince Philip's infamous gaffes, he's remained very popular with the public. Prince Philip is one of the most well-loved members of the royal family. He really was the kind of comedic companion to the Queen. He has been sort of a wonderful husband to the Queen, so supportive. So the essential ingredient of any happy marriage, and uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. <laughs> Sometimes it's not just the reputation of the royal family that's on the line, it's their safety. When there's a lapse in security, it's not simply a scandal, it's a matter of life and death. She could have been knifed, she could have been suffocated. Anything could have happened to our monarch lying in her bed. used to seeing the public lives of the royals, what goes on behind palace walls has always been more of a mystery. The royals have been hit by a number of scandals involving their personal security. Security scandals are scandals because... Well, if we can't keep some of the most important people in the country, the Prime Minister, members of the royal family alive, then what hope do we have for the rest of, you know, hoi polloi? As stories have emerged of royal security lapses, they've given us a glimpse into the private lives of our royal family. In the early 1980s, an intruder at Buckingham Palace got dangerously close to the Queen. I think in this day and age especially, the security of the Queen is of the utmost importance and we have to ensure that we do have the best security in place and, and protection for her. You would think that Buckingham Palace is one of the most secure properties in the land. You're wrong. 7 a.m. on a hot July morning in 1982, 33-year-old unemployed decorator Michael Fagan was suffering from severe depression after the breakup of his marriage. He found himself outside Buckingham Palace and spotted an open window. Back in the day, the security was there, but not enough. Fagan scaled the 14-foot-high perimeter wall. After clambering up a drain pipe and through the open window, he began wandering the corridors of the palace. Within minutes, he reached the wing housing the royal apartments, 
including the Queen's bedroom. He had managed to completely evade royal protection and security and get straight to the Queen. On his way in, Fagan had set off an alarm sensor, but thinking the alarm was faulty, the police silenced it. To make matters worse, the armed police officer, who should have been outside the royal bedroom, was away from his post. Fagan walked straight into the Queen's bedroom, where she was fast asleep. He could easily have killed the Queen in her bed, and that would have been it. He sat on her bed, and apparently she kept him calm by having a nice chat. Minutes later, the palace police bundled him out of the room. Her Majesty told me the story personally. I said, well, that's extraordinary. She's plus, he was gripping a broken ashtray and he was bleeding on my counterpane. All she was worried about was the blood stain on her bedclothes. She wasn't worried about her safety at all. Anything could have happened to our monarch lying in her bed. She could have been knifed, she could have been suffocated. It was a huge scandal at the time. Horrifying for a nation who expect their monarch to be better protected. The embarrassment and the scandal reverberated through the corridors of Buckingham Palace, down the Mall into Westminster. It was such a national scandal that the Home Secretary offered his resignation. The Queen said no, but he obviously felt embarrassed enough to offer it, and I think that was right. Michael Fagan wasn't charged, but did spend the next six months in a psychiatric hospital. The scandal meant that royal security was doubled, and Her Majesty could sleep safely. Two decades later, the royals were hit by yet another security scandal at Prince William's 21st birthday party. It seemed lessons hadn't been learned. It's impossible to believe that an imposter can get into Windsor Castle, particularly something as high profile as Prince William's 21st birthday party. And yet that's what happened. The theme of the party was out of Africa. Unbeknown to the news crews filming the build-up, they'd caught on camera the man who would be on the front pages of the tabloids the next day. And it wasn't the birthday boy. Happy birthday! Dressed as Osama bin Laden wearing a ball gown, a little-known comedian, Aaron Barshak, the self-styled comedy terrorist, was parading around Windsor's streets, pretending to be one of Will's party guests. You can see from the footage Barshak walking up Castlegate, up to the castle, all dressed up as a comedy terrorist with a big black beard and his robes. Because, of course, trying to monitor who's meant to be there and who's not meant to be there when everybody is dressed in ridiculous outfits does make it harder for the security services. However, the comedian was dressed in a pink dress and a fake beard, so he clearly didn't fit with the theme. He should have set security alarm bells going much earlier than he did. But, in fact, he was able to slip in undetected. How he managed to scale the walls, how he subsequently managed to infiltrate the party. I mean, this was the stuff of almost unbelievable reports the next day. The walls of Windsor Castle successfully kept out the rebel barons in the 13th century, but they were no match for a man in a peach-coloured ball gown and a false beard. He managed to get past the police security and into the castle, which, by the way, is a pretty big place, straight into the party. I mean, that was a huge security breach. Barshak climbed onto the stage where Prince William was making a speech. He kissed him on the cheek before eventually being detained. He certainly shouldn't have been allowed to get anywhere near, let alone kissing distance, um, of William. The fact that he got on stage, no one realised anything was wrong until Prince William looked at him and said, who the hell are you? It is rare for almost all senior members of the royal family to be gathered together in one place. And if Barshak had been someone with evil intent, well, you can imagine the consequences. There was a huge public outcry. David Blunkett, the Home Secretary at the time, um, had to make grovelling apologies on behalf of the police. Security breaches don't get any bigger than that. It was a huge royal scandal, and suddenly all of the attention was off the birthday boy and on what was essentially a massive security threat. David Blunkett did also, interestingly, put the boot into the royal family. He clearly wasn't prepared to take the full blame on behalf of the police and said that the royal had specifically asked for lighter touch policing on that night. Every tourist would be talking about very different stories today. Could the lack of security around the royals have prompted the idea behind the next breach? Less than six months later, an undercover reporter infiltrated the royal household and got a job as a footman. The reporter faked a CV, bogus references, and somehow 
managed to elude royal security and all of the checks that surely go with applying for a job in the household. The Daily Mirror even managed to take this grainy photograph of their fake footman, Ryan Parry, standing on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. The Mirror journalist described how his uniform guaranteed virtually unlimited access to every part of the palace. For the Daily Mirror, this was a massive coup, revealing the most astonishing details about the domestic lives of the royal family. The fake footman had access to the royal family's personal apartments and even took photos of the table where he served the Queen and Prince Philip their breakfast. He revealed these fascinating details of, of breakfast with the royals, the Queen feeding her corgis marmalade and toast underneath the table. They all thought Queen would be eating off gold plate, and the idea that her muesli is brought to her in, in Tupperware boxes sort of really appealed to people. The British public were able to gawp at what Her Majesty eats for breakfast. The country was shocked someone with a fake CV could get so close to the Queen just makes you wonder about how many other people they've employed who have had slightly dubious backgrounds. Even more embarrassing was the timing of the scandal. He was there on the eve of a presidential stay. In fact, he saw the president's bedroom. There could have been a real, real scandal over the fact that this undercover reporter was working within feet of President Bush while he was a guest of the Queen. For the palace, utter humiliation, an absolute breach of royal security. While security staff can be hired and fired, even the royals can't choose their in-laws. The Markles, they're not going anywhere. Meghan's family obviously want to cash in on her fame and her royal connections. May 2018, Prince Harry married Meghan Markle in a fairy tale wedding, watched by the world. I think the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle really captured most people's imagination. And it was like a film set. I think it was an American in the royal family. And the royal wedding itself was like a giant street party. Everybody loved it. For the Windsors, a royal wedding means welcoming a new set of in-laws into the family. The royals have had a, a brilliant way at dealing with the in-laws. We always used to call them the outlaws because they were not hugely welcomed in. But that has changed in recent years. The royals are now much more welcoming to those whose families of those who marry into them. But new in-laws bring their own potential for scandal beyond the control of the palace press machine. Since Meghan's engagement, her family have been a gift for the scandal-hungry tabloid press. One thing you have to understand about the Markle family is it's a rather dysfunctional family, especially from where we're sitting here. The run-up to the royal wedding was a very, very difficult time, I think, for Meghan and for Harry. And what should have been the happiest day of their lives was overshadowed by a very unhappy build-up to the wedding. Meghan's half-sister, Samantha, was never far from the headlines and isn't shy about sharing her opinions. Having previously labelled Meghan a social climber, she revealed she was writing a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. Meghan and her half-sister, Samantha, have never been close. It is abundantly clear that Samantha Markle is deeply jealous of her. She's also been outspoken on Twitter. In one outburst branding Meghan the Duchess of Nonsense. The Markles have caused a huge amount of problems. Uh, Samantha is off the rails as far as the thing that, things that she says. In the weeks before the wedding, the scandals kept coming. Many of the Markles have been keen to cash in on their fame through their new royal connection. And no one is doing that better than Tyler Dooley, her nephew, who is growing cannabis. Quite legally, he decided that he was going to launch a brand of cannabis called Markle's Sparkle. You can't control the families they marry into, particularly if the families they're marrying into are on the other side of the world, in the United States. They are citizens of another country. They do things in a different way. Some royal observers think the problems with Meghan's family became even worse after Harry appeared on Radio 4's Today programme. Were there family traditions you had to explain to her? 
Oh, plenty. I think that's probably, I, mean, I think we've got one of the biggest families that I know of and every family is, uh, is complex as well. So no, look, she, she's, she's done an absolutely amazing job just, you know, right. getting in there and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the family that she, I suppose she's never had. Harry's comment about Meghan's family sparked a very public war of words with the Markles. It was a crass remark, I think, uh, social media, Twitter sphere, if you like. Um, Samantha Markle is very handy on social media, and she responded pretty much immediately, saying, well, wait a minute, there is a family here. We were all there when Meghan was growing up, and the palace should have intervened quickly to nip it in the bud. A simple in invitation to the wedding would have solved it. But wedding invitations weren't forthcoming. I think Samantha Markle, along with the rest of the Markle family, have been hurt by being ostracized. I think by being pushed to the margins and left out of the biggest street party in our country last year really, really hurt them. Then, Meghan's half-brother Thomas Jr. decided to have his say in the press. He decided in his wisdom that he was going to write an open letter to Prince Harry um, suggesting that he called off the wedding and saying, it's not too late, mate, to get out of it and my half-sister is shallow and, and jaded and, and conceited. Obviously, that was mortifying for poor Meghan and Prince Harry, who really wants to protect her from her family, as far as I can see. The biggest scandal of all involved Meghan's father, Thomas, and some fake photographs. All had seemed well when Kensington Palace announced he would be walking his daughter Meghan down the aisle. We were all looking forward to seeing both her mother and her father at her side on the wedding day. But as the date got closer and closer, it became apparent that there was a problem with her relationship that she had with her father and whether he was actually going to be able to attend. Two weeks before the wedding, what appeared to be paparazzi photos emerged of Thomas Markle being measured for a wedding. wedding suit. Another image showed him in an internet cafe near his home in Mexico, looking at pictures of Meghan and Harry. But soon after their publication, it emerged that Thomas Markle had colluded with a photographer to stage the photos. During the run-up to the Meghan and Harry wedding, there was a lot of attention put on to Thomas Markle, who felt that he was getting a lot of bad publicity. He was being portrayed as a sort of reclusive, penniless slob in Mexico. It was sort of the image that he felt he was getting, and he wanted to correct that image. So he decided, in his wisdom, or distinct lack of wisdom, that he would set up these photos that showed him, in his opinion, in a better light. The focus of the wedding shifted from the bride and this great British event to the bride's father. The British press had a field day. Samantha Markle admitted advising her father to do the photos. They were both accused of ruining Harry and Meghan's imminent wedding. Whether he was financially rewarded for them, we're not entirely sure, but the assumption was he was being paid for these pictures. And that started alarm bells ringing at Buckingham Palace. And then, of course, there was so much written about how this must be very, very humiliating for Meghan and what's her relationship 
relationship and is he going to come to the wedding after all or not? Which was, of course, the big question, uh, question mark about all of that. Was Thomas going to walk Meghan down the aisle? As the clock ticked down to the big day, it was reported Thomas Markle was in hospital with heart problems, meaning he wouldn't be at the wedding. It turned into a huge fiasco for the royal family. This was a man who had to miss his daughter's wedding, who was flailing around not knowing what to do and ended up in hospital with a heart attack. In the end, Prince Charles stepped in. As a father of a daughter, more than anything, you want to give your daughter away, I'm, I'm certain, at her wedding. And the fact that he couldn't do that must be a sense of deep, deep sadness to him. Could the whole scandal have been avoided? Now, wouldn't you think they'd learned their lessons from the past? Wouldn't you think that they'd send somebody out to America to take care of the father of the bride? Thomas Markle was a loose firework waiting to go. But Dickie Arbiter, the Queen's former press secretary, says that Buckingham Palace was powerless to intervene. A lot of people were saying prior to the wedding that maybe the palace should have done more to protect Thomas Markle. It suggests that Harry and May country First of all, you've got to ask the Queen's permission, A, if they can go. Then you've got to say to the government you want to go. You almost can't just jump on a plane. The controversy surrounding Thomas Markle and the fake photos put a huge strain on his relationship with Meghan. And there was worse to come. Meghan tried to mend the rift and wrote to her father. What did he do? He released that letter, a personal letter from his daughter to himself, to the media. If every time she writes to him or rings him, he, he talks to a journalist, then she's going to stop doing it. So she's going to have to cut him out of her life, I fear. To make matters worse, six months after the wedding, Thomas Markle appeared on TV, complaining Meghan had cut off all contact. I've been trying to reach out uh, for several weeks. Every, every day I try to text her. Um, I just haven't received any comment back. And Samantha appeared on Channel 5's Jeremy Vine show to defend what she'd said about Meghan. I've got a brother. If I fall out with him, what I'm not going to do is tweet insults at him because then he won't talk to me. Isn't that how we all work with each other? What was going on that didn't make sense is that I really started to feel protective over our father. Because but why insult her? I don't understand. Because he was being purposely ignored. Sure, but, but, but how does it help him to alienate Meghan? I don't understand. Help me understand. We were hoping that private channels would be used. They're not when being they, used. When they failed, we went public. I don't think Samantha Markle is going to go away anytime soon. There will always be debacles with the Markles. They're not going anywhere. And whenever they step into the light, they will cause another scandal, another problem for Meghan and Harry. Next time on Scandals at the Palace. As the royals become more accessible, they also become easy targets, and often they're caught out on camera. And the thing which got her into hot water was that she could get access to Prince Andrew, her ex-husband, for half a million pounds. Where there are royals, a ferocious tabloid media, and a public desperate to know everything about them, scandals are never far away. The Iron Duke had turned into the Duke of Hazard.